Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the webinar on adaptive grazing management and how we can increase your pasture productivity. I'm Ellen Crane, the Extension Coordinator for the BCRC, and I will be your moderator for tonight. This session will last for approximately one hour and may go longer depending on the number of questions you've got for us later on during the question and answer period. If you're on Twitter, tweet along with us using the hashtag BeefWebinar. We are recording this session and I will email at the link to the recording to everyone that registered in a couple of days. So if you miss hearing anything tonight or you want to watch it later, you can. Of course, you'll be able to hear and see tonight's presenters, but we can't hear or see you. If you want to communicate with us, type into the small chat window in the control panel on the side of your screen. If you have a question or comment for me or either of the, presentation, of the presenters, that's the place to do that. And feel free to send questions in at any time. We'll answer them all near the end at the end of the hour. If your internet connection is a bit slow tonight, it might help to close other programs that are using the internet as well. Uh, you may also close the webcam window, which means you won't be able to see us, but hopefully that will make the audio come through more clearly and get the, slow, the slides to load a bit faster for you. And with that, let's get started. This is what we will be covering tonight. Um, you're going to hear from two speakers on the webinar today. They will each be talking about adaptive grazing management and then we will open up for questions and answer period. I'm pleased to welcome our first speaker for tonight, Grant Lestica. Uh, Grant is a forage extension specialist with Alberta Agriculture and Forestry at Olds, Alberta. Grant works with forage stakeholders and grazing systems in various extension capacities. These efforts are almost always related to realizing the value and seizing the opportunity of managing forages to be a highly productive crop. This forage management thought is from the plant to the soil, to the livestock, to the people, and to the consumer. The systems he works towards are managed in ways that consider finances, the environment, the people, and the community. This holistic management decision making approach is done simultaneously and strives to be in regenerative waves. So with that, I will pass this on over to Grant. Please turn on your webcam and turn off your mic. All right, can you see me and hear me? Yes, we can. All right, great. We're pretty excited because the Beef Cattle Research Council has gone ahead and taken on the foragebeef.ca website that many of you have been familiar with, I hope. It's a website that collects the top knowledge nuggets, it collects uh, fact sheets, research papers, and develops those for understanding for anyone that wants to look at them. And with that in mind, the Beef Cattle Research Council, Janice Brunet and others have been working on freshening it up, bringing it to you on the Beef Cattle Beef Research, BCRC website and in a way that's going to be hopefully even better than it was in the past. This is an effort to bring Canadian, in fact, um, information, but good US information and other countries as well to the forefront so that you'll be able to look through things if you wanna do it quick, if you wanna do it more in depth, if you want greater understanding, some of those are all gonna be put together. And if you go there, the grazing management side, which, which Sean McGrath will be talking about tonight, was just launched last week. So that's really exciting. And then but springtime, of course, when everybody's starting to think about the hay season silage, that module's gonna be, in fact, the stored forages one is gonna be up. So, we're hoping that whole site, if you're familiar with it, is going to be transferred, the applicable information, the freshness, a new approach. So it's not gonna be the same, but we're excited about it because what it's going to do is I think, bring it into the 20th, 20th century kind of approach. And that's gonna be the end of April uh, of next year. Hopefully all of it will be rolling right along. Can you advance me please, Ellen?
another thing that we thought would be a really good idea, and Jolene Noble's been working hard on this, is in fact bringing forward to the grazing resources and other things a pasture school. There seems to be a lot of people that don't have the time to get out there and be able to spend uh, time going to one or find one that's suitable depending on where you are. And so with that thought in mind, an online version at the BCRC website is going to be present. And with that version, as it said, self-guided, but it'll be an opportunity to deal with the modules. You'll be able to pick and choose what is most interesting to you, what you need to know right now, maybe for a time, spring turnout, for instance. What should we look at there? What is the thought there? And so, and hopefully this is going to be in a way in which that you can digest it in a manner of understanding and learning and building on that learning so that in fact it ends up being a Lego building block approach where the more you learn, the more you can learn. And that's the beauty of how Jolene and the team are putting it together. It's going to have the written side, but it's also a picture's worth a thousand words when videos best describe it or needed for it, that'll be present to help you walk you through some of the things that are going to be more able to see in action and understand. So the idea of the flexibility so that people can do it at their own leisure, do it at their own time, target modules that are really needed at this point in time in the year. What if their conditions are really dry? as they are this fall last year, even into the year before for many people, that could be an area you want to focus on, but that's going to be something coming down the line. And it's going to be on the, on the Beef Cattle Research Council site under the research side. So we're quite excited about that coming, and I know Jolene's been working really hard on that. Advance, please. The one thing that tonight brings is Sean's going to do his best to walk you through uh, grazing management and putting your head around it. And from that standpoint, he's just one resource. It has been exciting through all these years to watch what's happened. And for those of you that know me, it's been a lot of years I've been in the grazing side of things and the business and across Canada. The fact is there is a tremendous amount of good information, results based on what the organization is doing, fact sheets even, and upcoming events, other things on the provincial Forage Council websites. So don't miss out on them. The fact is that they are current, they're updating, they're fresh. There's an opportunity there to bookmark them so that you can in fact follow. And I myself, to be honest with you, I follow the Manitoba Forage and Grassland Association site. Why? I like what they do. And what they do often applies to what I might wanna do though I'm in a different province. And we've got some tremendous people across the provinces working together with the forage councils in different ways and also with the provincial governments. So we've got, whether it be regional or provincial governments, they've also got websites. And those websites, in fact, are houses, houses that have all kinds of good information on them that BCRC is going to support and try to get it down to a, a nice core. But you're going to find things that certainly BCRC can't have. And that is the currentness maybe of what's going on in different provinces. And because the different provinces are a little bit different, you'll find that's, as you look at the provincial forage councils, there are some differences. And when we get into the Maritimes, the organization Perinia does an excellent job of pulling together information and then, of course, we look at the New Brunswick Soil and Crop Improvement Centre, and they've been active in forages for years, and I've known them, and fortunately know that 
those are one-stop shops at times or good connection shops. So use your provincial government, your regional government offices, use your forage councils to build on the resources and things that Sean's talking to you about tonight where you need more information and you'd like to look at it a little bit more from an advancement side and get into the system because at times we find some of the, what's happening across the provinces really does fit together well. And so there are tremendous resources out there in grazing. The internet is our friend, certainly just as we deal with uh, the, the soil health and the vascular arbomuscular mycorrhizal fungi, I call it the internet of the soil. And it is in fact, just like these resources here, their connectedness, the communication, and we're very fortunate that BCRC is pulling a lot of this together for us. So I think that's about all I had to say, and uh, we'll get Sean off to a good start. Um, I don't think there's anything more. So Ellen, I'll pass it back to you, please. Thank you very much, Grant. Uh, next, we will have Sean McGrath. Sean is a fifth generation rancher who together with his wife Tanya and their family manage a 112 year old operation, breeding roughly 300 females each year and custom grazing another 200 pairs in the summertime. The ranch mark is purebred and commercial cattle as well as grass finished cattle and is structured around grazing. In 2014, the ranch was awarded the Provincial and National Tessa Award. Sean also provides consulting services to the beef industry, primarily focusing on livestock genetics and ranch and range management. Sean writes for several beef industry publications and through his company markets electric fencing supplies, forage seed, and ranch monitoring education and tools. So before we start with Sean's presentation, I'm going to launch one polling question. So please select your answer and uh, we'll close it here in a minute. So which region of Canada do you currently operate in? Do you operate in Western Canada, the Prairies, Eastern Canada, or Atlantic Canada? Okay, we give a couple more seconds there. So our results indicate 38% uh, Western Canada, 44% indicated the prairies, 15% from Eastern Canada, and 4% from Atlantic Canada. Okay, Sean, do you have your presentation ready there? Sure do. Perfect. Can you just share your screen? Good. Looks good to me. Um, thanks for the invitation. Um, it's a bit unnerving to talk without seeing people face to face, but we'll see what we can do. Um, when Grant had asked me to talk about adaptive grazing, I think one of the things we need to think about tonight is that it, it's not necessarily um, 10,000 miles of electric fence moving cattle every two hours. It's really using our resources that we have available in whatever region we're in and whatever our operation looks like to try and match plants and animals together over the course of the year. So we'll use a whole bunch of different techniques depending on where we live and how things, how things grow and what season they grow in. Um, but adaptive grazing is really about adapting to the conditions that exist on our own individual farms or ranches. So just this is a diagrammatic representation of a ranch um, just to kind of stick in the back of your mind um, I think a question to keep in your mind or ask over the course of this 
and about your own operation is which one of these ranches has more forage. So this diagram, they're both exactly the same number of cows, both exactly the same size. Um, but as we go, I think you'll hopefully come to some conclusions about which one of these ranches has some has more forage than the other. So if we start with the key principles, some of the key principles of grazing are basically that we're in the business of capturing sunlight and water and converting it into food. Um, the plants on our operations want to grow, whether they're weeds or plants that we want, they do want to grow. Um, as managers, I think our Obviously, we want those plants to grow. So one of the key definitions that we need to think about from a plant perspective is, is the term of overgrazing. And that's basically grazing a plant before it's recovered from the previous grazing event. And we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit as we go. So we all know that our operations need to focus on energy efficiency. Um, and really, we're growing a ranch or a farm is basically those plants or solar panels. And to make them efficient, we need to make sure that there's some solar panels there to start with, but also that they cover a big part of the ground. Um, one of the things with the grazing system and why we're actually really interested in it, I think, um, is that it's usually cheaper to graze than it is to feed cattle or manually deliver feed to cattle. Um, but again, you need to take time to figure it out on your own operation. Plants are pretty remarkable. Um, beings and they're actually a good way to store sunlight for other seasons so basically indirectly our cattle eat sunlight um, and finally the last thing we're going to touch on is that it, it's really important um, to measure our systems and it's important to measure what is important to us so when we think about grazing one of the things we're primarily concerned about is actually yield so we know that yield drives cost um, I've just got an example here and I know across the country land rents will vary and production will vary. Um, but if just a simple math example, if we rent pasture land, for example, at $50 an acre, if we can get 15 animal unit grazing days an acre, so 0.5 AUMs, we're actually going to cost us $3.33 per day for each cow. Um, if we could get that production up to 60, all of a sudden we can drop that same rent cost down to 83 cents per day per cow. So what if we need, what if we could get that up to 75 or 100 or some areas of the country, we can do a lot better than that. So, um, you know, really the trick to yield is, is that plants need time to grow. So in the, in the previous slide, we talked about this animal unit grazing day. That's for graziers, that's kind of our bushels or our bushels per acre. Um, basically a simple way to think about it is the amount of forage consumed by a thousand pound cow in one day. So if we had 1,500 pound cows, um, they're the equivalent of one and a half of those 1,000 pound cows or 1.5 animal unit grazing days. Um, we can roughly figure that out as, as about 25 pounds of dry matter. Uh, you know, on mixed grass prairie, that might be as small as 30 pounds of actual forage. Um, in some of the wetter regions of the country or on washy forage, that might be up to 75 pounds of actual as delivered forage that that cow eats in a day. So. The way we track this is highly technical. Uh, it requires a calendar and on that calendar you're just going to write down how many cows you had, what day they went into the pasture and what day they left. Um, from there we can calculate our animal unit grazing days. So if we were to just use a quick example to go through to figure out that yield, um, if we had 80 heifers that were 500 pounds, we put them in a pasture, I picked April, 30 days because it's easy math. Um, 30 days times 80 heifers times 0.5 animal units is 1,200 animal unit grazing days. If we had those same heifers but they were 1,000 pounds, um, we would double that number of grazing days up to 2,400. If the pasture happened to be 40 acres, again, for easy math, if we took that 1,200 divided by 40, we've got 30 animal unit grazing days per acre. That's our bushels per acre. And in the second scenario, we're actually pulling 60 days an acre. So um, double the production. So when we think about what the requirements are and trying to match requirements for the cow to the, or the forage to the cow, um, this is actually one of my favorite graphs. Um, you can see in the middle of the, sort of the concentric squares, that would be sort of the zero energy requirement. And as the cow gets, or as the blue line gets closer to the center of that squares, um, those would be the periods where the cow requires the least amount of energy. As the line moves away from that center, that's where the cow requires the most energy. Um, we can see the numbers as well 
uh, second trimester above that I've got seven, third trimester I've got nine, and rebreeding I've got 11. So those are actually the crude protein requirements, rough rule of thumb for those cows at, at those various times of the year. So you can see in the second trimester, so the cow, you've probably weaned a calf, six month old calf is off of her. Um, she's got a fetus inside. She only requires 7% crude protein and her energy requirements are the lowest of the entire year. So that's really when we like to have the lowest quality forage available. Uh, we can make it go the furthest. Um, if we move into rebreeding on the opposite side of that spectrum, our crude protein jumps up to 11 um, and our energy requirement jumps dramatically. So basically that cow has a three month old calf that's sucking. Um, she's trying to get in shape to rebreed and she's got these huge requirements. So in a perfect world, that would be when we have the most and the highest quality forage available for that cow. So um, just something to keep in mind when we're, we're designing our systems, whether that means we need to supplement those cows or, um, or we can plan our calving and per grazing periods so that our forage naturally meets those needs. So we take the cow requirements and we think through um, and kind of match it to these plants and how plants grow. Um, this is a figure taken from Beef Research, the new site. Um, as the plant grows, the yield increases um, and the quality or the crude protein will tend to decline. Where we're really trying to focus most of our grazing is to try to keep those plants, generally speaking, in that phase two kind of stage. Um, typically in the spring, we want to give those plants a chance to get into phase two, build some solar panels. Those solar panel leaves will help to drive roots into the soil. That's how we access and store moisture. Um, that's kind of how we get started and, and build some resiliency and drought proofing into our operations. I've got here on the left hand side of the screen, there's a picture of some hay bales um, and a couple of reasons. One, that's the first bale my son ever baled, but also Hay is a good analogy for, for pasture management. So hay is generally grass, pastures are generally grass. Um, we would never cut a hay field on the 1st of June and come back and hay it again on the 10th of that same month. Um, we would allow that pasture or that hay field to recover before we attempted to take more hay. That's how we'd maximize yield and, and quality out of that field. And so a pasture really is no different and that's, that's just a good analogy to keep in, in the back of our mind as we go forward. So how do we control the animals so that they graze it kind of the same way we'd graze a hay field, right? We can park our hay bind. Well, how do we park our cows um, off of that, off of that pasture? So one of the first and obvious, and I, I'm not sure, Ellen, if you have a poll question here or not, um, is to use electric fence. I do have it. Do you want me to poll right now? Sure, that would be great. Okay, so same as previously, uh, are you familiar with electric fencing? I use it on my operation, I occasionally use it, I know of it, and I peed on one once and am now afraid of it. Okay, just a couple more seconds. Okay, so we've had some brave ones out there. Uh, I use it on my operation at 61%. I occasionally use it at 14%. I know of it at 16%. And some about eight brave souls have peed on one once and now I'm afraid of it. So there's your results, Sean. Super. Um so one of the reasons we talk about electric fence, we'll, we'll talk about it in the next slide, but basically it's, it's fairly straightforward how it works. We've got an energizer, um, again on the left hand side, the power comes out of the red button and through this, in this case, the top wire, the bottom wire or the earth underneath is where the power comes back to the fence. So those are two separate basically parts and the cow is the light switch. So when the cow hits or connects the top wire to the ground or the top wire to the bottom wire, the current goes through the cow, 
and that's what stops her from going through. So the reason we talk about electric fence um, as opposed to other options um, is largely related to cost. Um, so electric fence, if you think it works, it does. And if you think it doesn't work, I can guarantee you that it won't. Um, in our experience, the biggest problem we run into when we're working with electric fence is that people don't put enough ground rods in. Um, I'll often hear complaints about wildlife damage as well. Um, you know, just don't turn the fencer off and the wildlife will learn to go around it, over it, under it, um, but they avoid it. They, they know it's there. Um, when we look at cost, so the handsome guy in the picture is actually uh, myself. We use a lot of portable fence uh, to control grazing on paddocks depending on weather. Um, but when we look at cost, you know, it takes about a third of the posts. Uh, it takes $87 for three quarters of a mile of wire as opposed to um, $54 times three or four for to build a quarter of a mile of barb. Um, and again, significantly less labor. So uh, one of the things in the winter time we may want to look at using, as in the previous picture, just a ground wire. Um, depending where you live, if there's a lot of snow and insulation, sometimes they're not as conductive in the winter time. So why would we use this fencing? Well, again, I've pulled an example from home. Uh, obviously, your place may vary. This is just a 90-acre grazing cell that we operate. Um, if you look through the picture, there's actually 21 paddocks. They're outlined in red. Uh, that's all electric fence. Um, average, we run about three days per paddock. So if we have all the cows in that field on one paddock, that means there's 20 other paddocks that aren't being used. So by the time we go through the whole rotation um, and get back to where we started from, that paddock has actually had 60 days of recovery or two months. So that's a, a significant recovery time. Um, I don't really like the term rotation. Uh, it kind of implies you start at one and go to two and three year after year. Um, you want to start in the paddock with the best condition. And sort of a good rule of thumb is when you've got a paddock that's in better condition than the one they're in, move to that paddock. Um, not necessarily a set pattern or a set traffic or tr set route through the paddocks. Um, you want to be moving to the paddock that's in the best condition, has, has had the most recovery. So um, that's just kind of a general rule of thumb. Not every uh, terrain or, or situation is, is conducive to electric fence. Um, so one of the things that we do and can work quite well in a lot of situations is, is using the landscape for fencing um, or use natural features of the landscape to control that cattle movement. So uh, again, this is example from home, just south of the, that paddock. You can kind of see it at the top of the picture. Um, in the top roughly left-hand corner of that overhead, um, you can see a, dark, a heavy red line. Um, this is actually a coulee at home, lots of slope, um, lots of bush, and the cows don't really like going up and down the hill. So we actually run, I guess it's about a 40 foot piece of electric wire over the edge of the hill. Um, and it stops the cattle from going onto that west side of the pasture. Does it work perfectly? No, but it helps us control movement enough that we can, we can manage our grazing and, and move pressure around to air, different areas just through the use of a short piece of fence. If you look on the sort of the creek that's highlighted in through the middle of the picture and just about to the top of the creek, you'll see a, a heavy black band. Um, that's ac actually representative. There's a there's a bridge that's been put in there for some reclamation work that's going on. Um, again, a landscape feature that we use. Um, we'll go down and herd cattle over that bridge to the other side of the creek. Um, put a 20 foot stretch of portable electrical across it or a, a gate, rope gate. Um, push the cattle into that southeast corner of that to to put pressure on there and, and remove it from other parts. Is it perfect? No. Um, but it does move the grazing um, pressure around and gives those other parts of that pasture a chance to recover. Um, again, it's not about being perfect and having your cows totally 100% controlled all the time. It's about, it's about giving those areas of your pastures time and those plants time to recover. So um, on the left-hand side, you can see another similar bridge on another piece that we own um, and we're herding cows across. So. You know, in some situations, just accessing and using the landscape you have available can be a pretty effective solution to improve your grazing. One of the areas I think 
we often overlook um, is the idea of combining cow herds. So a lot of farms and ranches actually have enough paddocks or enough pastures um, fenced already to reduce or allow recovery time, but we often tend to run little herds of 25 cows and of one bull, and we may run four or five of those. Um, simply by combining those herds, so in this diagram, uh, you know, we, all we've done is move the cows to one side of the fence on this ranch, um, but half the grass is having a chance to recover as opposed to cows being able to access all of the forage on that ranch. And the reason I bring this up and, and how it ties to, um, to some of the technology that's out there and some of the things we've overlooked. So at our place, we run two herds. Uh, we run grass, cattle, and breeding yearlings all together. And then we run every cow with a calf in a separate group. Um, we're working on a plan to combine those two groups. Um, may not happen, but we'd like to combine the groups. By doing that, we check the cattle more regularly. Um, we can run multiple sires. And some of the technologies that are out there that and have come down in cost. So on the bottom, there's a picture of a DNA collection tag. Um, the ability to use DNA to sire identify um, and those types of things even opens up the multiple sire option to seed stock purebred herds. Um, there's lots of new tools we can use where we can combine herds and still deal with animals individually, even on a genetic level. So it's something just to keep in mind as, as maybe an option and something to look at. One of the other areas we can use to kind of move those animals and control movement is, is through the use of supplements. Um, you know, we should be moving salt or mineral around pastures to areas that are underutilized. Um, we can also feed on those pastures. So on the right hand side, there's an example. Um, you know, we feed DDGs on pasture. We use it to move cattle around to different areas. Um, again, we also use it to, to meet the requirements of those cows um, at certain specific points of their, of their yearly cycle. Um, and I know water is a major nutrient and I've got it in the supplement slide, but with some of the new tools we've got for, for example, solar water pumping, um, we can move that water around an operation um, and, and the cattle will follow the water. So again, we can, oftentimes we can get at some of these adaptive practices and improve our forage base um, without necessarily having to build, you know, 500 miles of fence to accomplish a goal. One of the things I think we often overlook and we think about grazing is season of use. Um, you know, matching our plant growth to our cow requirements. Uh, we graze a lot of native in the wintertime, we also, but we do it with second trimester dry cows. Um, again, not for everyone. One of the ways we can preserve the quality of that forage is actually by cutting it. So that's how swath grazing works. Um, you know, there's some techniques we can use. One of the cool things with um, sort of off season grazing or unusual season grazing, so winter grazing, um, you know, this last week here, it's been minus 45. There's not a lot of plants growing. So over grazing a plant is, is pretty difficult when it's not in a growth phase at all. So um, there's some cool things we can do. We may need to look at including supplement in that, in that process. Um, if we've got energy requirements and those types of things that need to be met, but it's certainly an option for a lot of operations. So those are just a few things maybe to think about um, that may apply in your own operation. And obviously they'll apply in different ways in different parts of the country and for different operations. So once we decide what we're doing and we want to know if we're making progress, um, we want to record some things. Um, I think a good adaptive grazing program needs to be measured. Um, part of that's just eyeball and experience. So there's a lot of things in our operation. I, I don't know how we know. I just know. Um, you know, that's, it's one of the things that comes with time and, and with practice and knowing your operation. Um, we do need to track animal unit grazing days. I think that's fairly important. Uh, rainfall is typically the limiting factor for most of us. So um, some idea of rainfall is also worthwhile. We talked about the calendar again. Um, litter is a big thing we need to, I think, look at. Uh, so litter is, is the dead grass or the wasted grass that's not actually wasted. That's our security blanket that controls temperature, that stores water, that protects us from, from drought and weather extremes. Um, biodiversity is a big thing. Uh, 
especially when we start to look at, at public impact of grazing and, and those sorts of things. Um, and as well, soil, right? In, uh, you know, it wouldn't be uncommon to maybe fertilize a hay field or fertilize even a field of, of a grain crop or a small grains crop. Um, you know, there's no reason we shouldn't be looking at, at the soil underneath the pasture as well. We are growing a crop in that, on that soil. Um, one of the things that's often overlooked as well is, is feed testing. We often don't go out. Um, you know, we can quickly take our hand and grab a sample. Um, and get that feed tested and have an idea what that forage is providing for those livestock on, on that uh, on that piece of land. Um, in our operation we use a couple of tools we use uh, that I'll just mention in passing. We use Land EKG which is a formalized monitoring system. Um, again by being formal it, it forces us to be accountable for our decisions and gives us tools to assess whether we made a, the right decision or the wrong decision and from that we can adapt our management and do better next time. One of the things I thought might be of interest in, and it's fairly easy to implement. Um, again, we do ours through a formal process called Land EKG, but photo points are something that I think for a lot of us can be done fairly quickly, fairly simply. They're, you know, if you've got a camera on your phone that's more than adequate for doing this process. Um, basically, we take a series of pictures, um, either from a point in our pasture that we're worried and concerned about, or from a point where we can get a good vantage point of a representative sample of the pasture. Um, we pound a stake in the ground. Uh, example on the bottom left, I use a pale lid to tell me what the photo point is. Um, and you can see maybe there's two arrows on there. One points one direction and one curves to the right. Um, I stand on that pale lid roughly the same time every year. And I take a series of photos, two thirds of the land, a third of the sky. Um, and then spin in a circle and take pictures with about 20% overlap. I do it at the same place, same time every year. Um, if you put those photos next to each other over the course of time, you can tell if your decisions are, are moving you forwards or backwards. Again, these are just some of our other monitoring practices we use. Um, the bottom right is a grazing cage. We have some instructions on our website for how to build them um, and with a rain gauge in it and that we use the cows can't graze inside that cage. It's a really good tool to know how much you've taken off with your cows, how much you've left, um, if you're making progress, if you've messed up, uh, those types of things. We talked about litter. Um, I think it's I think it's worth its slide in itself. Um, I call it biomass, not just biomass. Um, you know, kind of the rule or the thing that turned me as a kid was that it takes grass to grow grass. Um, a good test of our pastures in a lot of the re air, in a lot of the country, um, you know, maybe not so much in some of the shorter grass regions is, is the shuffle test. If you uh, shuffle your feet and can make it from one side of your pasture to the other without any impediment, um, you probably have some room for improvement in litter and forage production. Um, you know, litter is, is our insurance against drought. It's our insurance. It's our it's our safety valve to store moisture. So um, again, it's it's a pretty important thing. This is this is taken from a Alberta Rangelands resource, and it just gives you a rough idea if you were to um, scratch up a square meter of uh, of litter off the ground, sort of how many pounds per acre you'd be looking at. Um, you know, a lot of operations wouldn't have very much, and, and depending on the type of forage, you may see different amounts. And we've, we've talked about litter kind of leads us into what I call the D word. So, um, you know, and I know across a lot of the country and even parts of Eastern Canada last year, um, drought raised its ugly head for at least the growing part of the year. Um, it's, it's pretty serious when it happens. So, it doesn't always rain where you live, but it, it's important that drought planning starts when it's raining. Um, it's a lot easier to plan ahead and have that resource in place when you've got some rain to build it up than it is to sort of try and react. Um, again, we talked about litter and organic matters, our rain barrel. Organic matter comes from letting those plants get started, get up to that three to five leaf stage and really drive those roots into the ground. Um, it seems kind of counterintuitive that 
that roots that are supposed to be taking up moisture for the plant are also producing the organic matter that stores or keeps that moisture in the soil. But that's actually the way it works. Um, we really need to be concerned about plant startup and recovery. Um, when it doesn't rain, plants grow slower. I think that's reasonably obvious to most of us. But that means we need to slow down our grazing or the speed we move through our system um, to give those plants longer to recover. Um, tough to do in practice lots of times, but, but that really is um, an important point. Um, you know, when these plants, and especially in the spring when these plants need time to start up, we're probably better to feed for an extra week or two in April or May um, than we are to kick those cows out and try and make up ground in November. We're better to let those plants get rolling. Um, again, one of the things that's really counterintuitive, uh, we want to oftentimes open all the gates and let our cows access the entire farm. The worst thing we can do because those plants are having such a hard time recovering from lack of moisture is to let those cattle access all the plants. We really need to keep our gates shut and control the movement of those cattle and give those plants a little bit extra recovery time. I like the use of trigger dates. We use them at our place. Um, we have set dates if there's not a certain amount of plant growth or a certain amount of moisture. Um, we move to our marketing hit list, I call it. Um, so if we don't have X amount of forage by 15th of May, every open cow is gone. If we don't have X amount of forage by the 1st of June, we use the grass yearlings, those yearlings are gone. Um, you know, drought can be a fantastic opportunity to get rid of that crazy bag that tried to run you down last winter that you just gave one more chance. Um, nothing gets an extra chance when it doesn't rain. So, um, you know, it's actually an opportunity to clean up some of our cow herds. And I firmly believe that a drought plan should be written down and those trigger dates are written in stone. Um, if it starts raining the day after you ship that cow, you know, there's a better cow out there you can replace her with. Um, or you can just let the grass grow. So um, having a plan is actually a, a pretty helpful tool for, for adaptive grazing. Um, one thing I like to say about a, a drought plan is, is just relax, enjoy the sunshine. If you create and stick to a good plan, the worst thing that's gonna happen to your drought plan is, is it's gonna get rained out. So finally, uh, again, first slide last, I guess, uh, in summary, we're really in the business of capturing sunlight and water. We can't do that without you know, letting plants grow. They want to grow, I want them to grow. To get them to grow, we have to try and work on that overgrazing piece um, and really need to focus on energy efficiency and having those leaves out there. Again, it's usually cheaper to graze. That's why we're interested in pasture management. It's cheaper for cows to harvest um, the forage themselves and for us to bring it to the cow. Um, you know, we're using those plants to store our relatively limited amount of sunshine in this country or seasonal amount of sunshine and distribute it through the year. Um, and again, it's really important to measure um, those grazing systems so we know if we're making progress. And finally, I, th I think the most important part about adaptive grazing management is that the whole process of grazing management needs to ex be experienced with others. So for myself, the opportunity to participate in this webinar, um, hopefully get a bunch of questions back and follow up is a tremendous opportunity to learn um, about our system and about others. Um, I make no bones about it. I'm going to steal every good idea I can come across um, but it's really an act of sharing and working on these on these systems and comparing notes with neighbors um, and others across the country and across the world that'll let us do a better job of of grazing management as we move forward so with that I'd just like to say thank you and I'll turn it back over to Ellen thank you very much Sean uh, so now we'll open it up to questions. Uh, you'll see either the bottom or the top of your screen, there'll be a Q&A box. Uh, there you can enter any questions that you have for Sean or Grant, um, and we'll open that up to them. Um, we've got a couple in here already. Um, the first one is for Sean, um, and it was on the crude protein uh, graphic that you've shown earlier. Uh, where are the crude protein percentages in the square graph sourced from? I have to think on that. I, th I think they actually came from the BCRC site, if I remember correctly. Okay. Uh, then you had a couple of questions here. Um, 
what do you do for water or do you use a lot of alleyways to move cattle to dugouts um, where you're doing your rotational grazing? We have quite a few alleyways in place, um, partly a remnant, a historical remnant of when we started using um, rotational grazing. Um, but as we've progressed, we've moved more to solar systems and those types of things. Okay, uh, you've shown a number of graphs that have a satellite picture of your different pastures. Can you quickly describe how you get those kind of images of your um, of your pastures? Uh, yeah, we used to use air photos long ago, but now um, actually if you go on Google Earth and you know um, you can go on Google Earth and get Google Earth Pro for free and you can access all those satellite pictures uh, basically for free. Okay, uh, for pasture rejuvenating, do you ever add legume seeds such as yellow alfalfa, sicer milk vetch uh, to, to the mineral to help increase diversity in pastures and use the cows to spread the seeds? We've done a little bit of that. Um, part of our program with with the rotation, we've got a lot of pastures that would probably be upwards of 90% legume. So we haven't really had an issue with trying to restore those legumes, but we have done some of that. We've done some direct drilling experiments um, and those types of things as well. Okay, uh, another one for Sean. Uh, do you ever worry about bricks management and moving grazing groups? Could you repeat that first part of that question? Uh, do you worry about bricks management in moving grazing? Okay. Um, yeah, we've looked at bricks. Um, so for those that may not be aware, bricks is basically a way to use a refractometer to measure sugar in the grass or energy content of the grass. Um, we use it a little bit, but I don't worry about it much at this point. Okay. Um, what do you do when it's too wet, so to prevent um, uh, tearing up your pastures and things like that. So I know that's an Eastern Canadian question. Yes, Because yeah. <laughs> if there's no such thing as too wet here, um, <laughs> you know, and that that can be an issue. Um, you know, stock density can help some of that in some oh. situations. Uh, sometimes I think you just have to, you know, particularly in, in like the maritime provinces, you may just have to pull them cattle off that pasture um, and look at different options for the time frame where it's, it's really is too wet. Uh, do you have a target yield of cow days per acre? Uh, I do, but Mother Nature messes with that a little bit. On our on our tame stuff, um, a good target on our older pastures is is 75 days an acre for us. On our native, uh, kind of a target would be 60 days an acre. Um, and then on our good quality tame stuff, we're looking at somewhere in hopefully the range of 100 to 120. And then on any type of annual, we want 160 plus. Okay. How are you monitoring plant regrowth after a grazing event? We go out and look at the plants, basically. Um, it's, it's a hands-on um, head out to the pasture and have a look. Uh, is it beneficial to run cattle across land in the early spring to start the grass's growing period, doing this in a skim grazing system. <laughs> Grant should jump in here, but um, the first slide was <laughs> called an it depends, graze, it depends grazing system. So the answer is it depends. Um, it can be beneficial. Um, it can also be risky if you live in an area that is prone to drought. Um, so, it, yeah, really the answer is it depends. I will jump in if that's okay, if you can hear me. Yes. Um, 
the premise behind it is that you're you stressing the plants and be it Kevin Sedovic or Llewellyn Mansky, there was a lot of discussion and Jim Garrish now talks about it, that once you get plants, tame pastures to the three leaf stage, native pastures to the three and a half leaf stage, that it's a means in which you can take away the suppression of growth of other tillers by literally taking away the capacity of the plant to create that lead tiller that will flower and hold back on all the other tillers so that that flower can make seed and such. So on a vigorous pasture going out there taking 25 to 33 percent once it's reached the three on a tame pasture, three and a half on a native, the idea behind it is recovered from winter gotten back reserves sufficiently to be at a high state of vigor, then going in there and simply slightly challenging the plant to regrow. But as Sean said so well, you've got to be careful because the answer to a lot of things are, it depends on the type of plant and everything. In a good gra managed grazing system, that system can work pretty well. On a stand that's been pretty beaten up, you might have all the yield you're going to have. So I'll stop there. Perfect. Any suggestions on how to get water to areas not being utilized grazing wise due to water availability where drilling is not an option and elevation is a problem? That's a that's a that's a tough one. Elevation is is creates expense when it comes to pumping water. Um, in a perfect world, you would have access to a pipe, be able to put a pipeline in either above ground or shallow pipeline um, with a pressure tank would be the lowest cost solution. Um, some of the new solar options are pretty good. So, for example, we have a solar pump here that'll lift seventy five feet. Um, you know, it, it opens up some options, but elevation is is a tough one um, short of hauling the water in some form of a tank and and then letting gravity do the work have you experimented using annuals to extend your grazing further into the winter or do you feel perennials are the least cost approach for you For us, it's all part of the system. So I hate feeding cows. Like we just don't feed cows. Um, so we use, we do use bale grazing quite a bit. Um, we'll use, we've used corn, we use annuals for swath grazing. Um, you know, we'll use those combinations. Um, for us, some mixed approach or, or um, system is really what works best for our operation. Uh, is there an opportunity to use precision, precision agriculture to manage grazing? Uh, one example is to use drone images to figure out overgrazed and undergrazed areas. There absolutely is, and I think it's one of the areas where we probably, as grazers, we've probably missed the boat um, quite a bit. Um, you know, you look at precision fertilization or differences in yield or um, you know, brush encroachment. Uh, there's, I mean, there's all kinds of tools on the precision side that we can steal and, and apply to our grazing situations. Uh, probably limited only by our creativity um, and the fact that we're not crop producers and we're not putting hundreds of dollars an acre in every year. Um, but for sure, for sure. Okay, we're just going to do one more question here. Can you elaborate on the different phases of plant growth and the, the nutritional benefits you get from phase one versus phase three? If there that are. Sounds like a grant question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can hop in if you want. Yeah, for sure. Adequate quality, but quantity is the game. 80% of animal performance is intake and thereafter adequate intake of course we're not talking about eating a tree trunk 
but the fact of the matter is depending on how we graze that it's very easy of access it's easy to get a full rumen um, the quality as long as it's suitable giving the animal the ability to be selective and as Sean made a comment about you know getting a feel for the quality of the forage certainly by grouping animals together and that's what you see in the mob grazing largely is they let forages get quite mature then they group the animals together and tramp everything down as they're going through and really create a beautiful habitat at the soil surface of everything that wasn't the best because the animals pick the best and leave the rest and so with that you might find that, and Dr. Um, Akima Wonkahe from the Peace Country Beef and Forage Association did some work, and, and our dear friend Neil Dennis, who just passed away, um, also had done so much to benefit the soil, to benefit the animals in a long way, um, a long approach, but it's leaving a lot behind and choosing to, in fact, and if it's higher legumes like Sean has as much as he has, if it's uh, some of these legumes that are hollow stem, like a red clover, um, Elsyk, uh, Sandpoint, they hold pretty good quality on the leaves. So the cows do pretty well, the calves do pretty well, and they tramp that down or maybe leave it for snow catch. And um, I don't complain by having snow catch by some plants standing up out there. So um, that kind of approach, I guess. And could I just add, like, there was one slide there where I talked about supplements. So, for example, um, we start thinking about volume. Volume is the part that is expensive to move around and feed to our cows. Um, so th that pile of DDGs that was there, they're about 40% crude protein. I can take a little bit of that out every few days to those cows and actually trick their rumen into intaking more low quality protein which they can, or low quality forage that they can get their need from. So from my perspective, getting the volume out there is really important and we can do some things probably more cheaply or more easily to supplement the quality that might not be there. And particularly in dry conditions or drought and that's something I know that I've learned from many of you whether it's urea minerals whether it is some supplement but let the grass grow up because you know that you want to have grass and then as Sean's saying so well deal with the lack of quality by touching it up or accept waste but the fact of the matter is when I'm concerned I'll usually let forages get ahead of me and get mass and let those plants grow so that I'll have something to graze later and do the supplement touch up. Okay so just a couple more important things to let you know before we go. One hat is how to get more information and science-based production advice through the BCRC. Uh, go to our website, beefresearch.ca, and click the subscribe button to sign up for our free email list. If you've got a Twitter, Facebook, or YouTube account, you can connect with us there. And be sure to join us for our next webinar on March 14th, What's in Your Water? water quality and the economics of pump systems. In the chat window of your control panel, no. Uh, in the next couple of days, you'll receive an email from me with a link to watch the recording, as well as some additional information that was mentioned here in this webinar, um, and some addition, uh, extra in resources as well. Um, you'll also receive a link to a survey uh, please take a few short minutes to fill that out. Um, that's really helpful for us so we can help to improve our webinars um, as we continue. Um, so that's it from us here at the BCRC. Thanks to you at home for joining us tonight. And on behalf of everyone, thank you, Grant and Sean, for volunteering your time and expertise. Uh, good night. <laughs>